uh, go back to our speaker uh, this uh, uh, session, Mr. Uh, Jerome Fontana, uh, the head of the uh, Red Cross uh, delegation in uh, Egypt. Uh, Mr. Fontana is, uh, 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 he joined uh, uh, the Red Cross since uh, 1998 and uh, he worked in different and many, so many uh, countries uh, around the world. Uh, he initially worked as a protection delegate and then as a program coordinator before receiving higher responsibilities in the management of the uh, Red Cross operations and security in uh, many uh, countries. So, Mr. Uh, uh, Fontana, uh, welcome and thank you for uh, joining us in this workshop. Yes. Th thank you very much, Hasha. Thank you very much to Africa 2021. Yes, thank I can you. hear you. Merci. So it's a real okay. pleasure for me. Okay, thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to be addressing uh, you today. And uh, as you explained, I'm the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, here in Cairo. And I just would like to present uh, a short presentation about the relationship between climate change and some kind of hazards which are basically linked to international or non-international armed conflict. Just before I start, can I just see with uh, Julien whether it's possible to share the, the screen, uh, my presentation, because I'm not sure you're seeing the, the main page of my presentation yet. Normalement, vous, vous pouvez le faire. Il y a un bouton qui s'appelle écran partagé en bas. Yes. Vous cliquez dessus, vous choisissez ensuite dans le bureau. Voilà, c'est parfait. Can you voilà. see the presentation okay. now? Parfait. OK, so, so let's perfect. start. Perfect, yes, yes, we yes. OK, thank, thank you so much. So, uh, but just before I start my presentation, I just would like to ask people in, who, are, who are listening to the presentation about uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Do, do you know a little bit about what the Red Cross is? And uh, why do you think that the ICNC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, would start uh, discussing about climate change and biodiversity? Uh, are you surprised or on, or not that much? Let me see if I can see some reaction in the chat. Do you know about the ICNC? Have you ever heard about uh, the ICNC, the International Can Red Cross? Can you please Cross? share your opinions in the chat? Or, or do you know more maybe the Egyptian Red Crescent Society? Have you heard about the Egyptian Red Crescent Society? Or, or, or not really? In fact, they, <clears throat> one of them, uh, one of the uh, journalists said uh, at the chat that uh, they were uh, uh, thinking that it was uh, only medical. That yeah, the Red Cross only medical. Why uh, climate change now? That's the reason I was asking the question because actually, the some people get confused, and I think it's important for me to explain at the beginning the difference between like the Egyptian Red Crescent and the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the fact that we are not not only exclusively a medical organization. But actually, the ICNC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, is one organization for the whole world specialized in helping victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence. So basically, we are specialized in helping victims of war. So uh, the presentation I'm going to give is to explain how climate change and situations of violence can overlap. And what's the, the added layers of complexity when you have like an armed conflict in one place and on top of it, you could have uh, a, a huge impact regarding climate change. So let, let's start with the, the explanations I would like to, to give. Okay, so basically, as you know, I guess you have heard uh, these last few days, every country around the world is, uh, is affected by climate change to in one way or another. So everybody is, uh, is concerned. Now, what is really different is that the level of vulnerability, the way it affects people's life can be very different from one place to another place. And unfortunately, the, the most vulnerable countries usually are also the most fragile contexts. 
So uh, the countries which are the less ready, the less prepared, and have the less means to, uh, to cope with uh, climate change. I, I don't know whether some of you have heard about this uh, ranking that the University of Notre Dame is doing about this global adaptation initiative. And basically what they found out is that among the 20 uh, most vulnerable countries, at least 14 are affected by conflict. So there uh, we see that there is an, an overlap between a uh, situation of conflict and countries most vulnerable for climate change. So why is that the case? Should we say that con armed conflict creates climate change or does climate change create conflict? Well, it's not, the link is not so uh, immediate, it's not so direct, the correlation is not so direct, but really, I think it had a layer of complexity. What I mean is that climate change is, is a threat multiplier. It means it's making a difficult situation even worse when we speak about countries affected by climate change. So it's really this I mean, conflict are disrupting societies, it's affecting people's life, and then the way they can cope or are stretched out and cannot really cope with the added suffering caused by climate change can be especially difficult for uh, countries who are experiencing, unfortunately, situation of armed violence or situation of conflicts. Are you following me so far? Is that okay? We are we on the same line? Let's move to something more specific now, especially when we speak about the Middle East. Well, actually, at first, at first sight, we, should, we might think that, okay, the most affected countries in the Middle East, the most affected countries the, by climate change in the Middle East are Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and obviously, it's also countries who are highly, um, you know, impacted by conflict situation. Now, again, this link is not so direct. Uh, we can have countries like Saudi Arabia, who are much bigger. They also are affected uh, by climate change, but in, in terms of number of people, in terms of resources available, they have more capacity to cope. Or when you look at the, um, the UAE, they also have, it's not that the climate is, is less uh, severe for them, but the capacity to react is maybe greater than if we take a country like Yemen, for example. So this kind of uh, aspect regarding not only the actual climate change situation, but the capacity to respond and the capacity to be able to cope with the situation is key in this uh, protection of biodiversity. And unfortunately, the reality is that countries affected by armed conflict uh, have lost of really struggling to, to have this uh, preparedness and the resources to be able to cope with, um, with climate change. If I give you another example, it, it does also mean that not every country who are, which are vulnerable to climate change are necessarily affected by an armed conflict. Do you have any, any idea of a country or any example maybe you can give me about what you think could be a country which is severely at risk of climate change, but at peace and, uh, and really, you know, having the capacity maybe to prepare and react or mitigate the effect of climate change. I don't know if some of you have some ideas about, uh, about countries. For me, what comes to my mind is Australia. If you take Australia, it's a huge country. Uh, it is definitely uh, vulnerable to climate change. Uh, but when it comes to be able to be able to prepare and cope with the situation, uh, I think they are better positioned than other countries, and especially countries which are maybe poorer. And on top of that, going through a, a crisis, being a natural crisis or 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 you know, like uh, armed conflict and other kind of disasters. So uh, now, if we go a bit further in terms of environmental changes, and there I really want to to emphasize like specific countries, 
how, how they are affected. And this is what we see in Africa. When you look at uh, the situation in countries like the Central African Republic, Mali, okay, we have Iraq as well in the Middle East. I mean, people have, uh, have a deep sense of loss and disorientation. What I mean is that they feel just, you know, having to, uh, so, I mean, suffer because of climate change without really having the, the mechanism in place to cope with that. So it's uh, this vulnerability and this lack of means to be prepared is something that can re really aggravate the living standard of the people. And there are many factors involved when we speak about the, the direct impact of climate change. I mean, in conflict affected countries, already access to water can be a problem. Access to education can be a problem. Access to medical care can be a very serious problem. Now, if on top of that, you have uh, climate change, which is making the situation worse, it can become unbearable. And that's to some extent what some people face in countries like the Sahel region, Mali, Niger, uh, Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, where it's really like a combination of, combination of factors that all make the situation even worse. Obviously, you know now with uh, COVID-19, maybe on top of that, you have even a health crisis uh, further de deteriorating the, the living condition of the people. Let me try to take, uh, uh, okay, there I, I have some information about Southern Iraq, where basically the conflict led to, um, to an aggravation of the situation because there was this uh, destruction of uh, dead palms, trees were cut down. So basically people had less uh, you know, means to cultivate and it was also a problem regarding access to water. So there, clearly, the armed conflict or the legacy of the conflict, the consequences of the armed conflict, aggravated the living condition in terms of uh, natural uh, environment and biodiversity. Can you imagine the opposite situation? Can you imagine that sometimes climate change, when it's linked to armed conflict, can transform the economic situation, not, not necessarily deteriorate, but change the dynamics between the populations. Have you ever thought of this kind of uh, situation where actually it's like it's changing the, the relation, relationship between populations, between local communities, and, and creating some new dynamics and new tensions? Maybe one example I can take is about the Lake Chad Basin. You know, this uh, Lake Chad, it's uh, the huge lake, which is in between Chad, Niger, and Northern Cameroon. If you look over the last 20 years, the lake, this lake has shrunk a lot. So the, the amount of water available has reduced. But actually in terms of um, access to land, you know, to, for agriculture, it has increased the, the possibility to cultivate lands or small islands now, which before in the past used to be underwater. So in that sense, the consequence of climate change has created new economic opportunities. Of course, it has reduced the number of people who can go uh, fishing because the lake has shrunk, so there's, there's less fish available, but now there are more farmers. Uh, so the, the impact of climate change is not always at first sight always immediately negative. It can also redistribute the, the relationship between, between communities. But then again, because of this uh, shrinking of the lake, which is at the border <coughs> between three countries, there are much more like traffic of whatever illegal smuggling of goods and weapons and people crossing this, uh, this key uh, network between boundaries and it can also increase the consequence of the conflict. And as you know, uh, it's also part of uh, the part of the world where Boko Haram, the, you know, the group linked to the Islamic State or different group links to the Islamic State are very active. So 
there we can see that the the impact of climate change and the shrinking of the of the lake Chad has had a direct consequence of the dynamic of the armed conflict and an, and the livelihood of the local population living in this part of the world. Are you following me? It's okay. Yeah. Do, you, do, do you understand what I mean? Yes. Okay. Yes, let's let's move further. Yes. So it's the same for Yemen, where you have a lot of uh, impacts of the, this new new environment uh, regarding the the biodiversity and uh, the climate change, which really is affecting every aspect of society. And there, it's especially important regarding the health crisis, uh, because they, they have much more malaria than they used to have in the past. But as I said also with COVID-19, the fact that there is a very severe armed conflict, international armed conflict taking place now in Yemen is, is further weakening the health system. And there are many people who die because of the armed conflict, but there are also many people who die because of the indirect consequences of the conflict and climate change, which is weaker health structures. So all that is combining, uh, are combining factors that makes the overall situation much worse for local communities. So how can we mitigate this, uh, this impact of climate change during the time of armed conflict? Actually, we have, we have rules, we have uh, norms, uh, which are codified in what we call the international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, which are already covering a lot of aspects about mitigating what we call unnecessary suffering. And basically it's the, the consequences on communities who are, who are caught in armed conflict. So, Already now we have in what we call the Geneva Convention, so the, the, the international humanitarian law, a lot of rules and provision prohibiting the attack on agricultural land or uh, prohibiting uh, attack on any object indispensable to the survival of the population, like access to water or other kind of, um, of basic needs that people have. And having a better respect of these international humanitarian law rules would definitely uh, reduce the suffering which are linked to climate change and armed um, conflict. So it's not what I want to say is that here uh, the we have the tools now uh, already now in place, uh, legal tools to uh, try to mitigate the effect based on international international law. So it's not that it's completely new and that there is no rules to be respected. Let me show you a very quick video because there you will see also very quickly about this impact between uh, the law, biodiversity, and the situation regarding armed conflict. It's a very short video. I think it's a bit, uh, slightly longer than one minute. So uh, let's try to watch that. Uh, I will share my screen again. I'm just opening the link to the video. Can you see my screen? Tell me if the video is uh, is a loading is loading or not. Yes. Yes, it's loading. Shasha Zahra. Par contre, il n'y a pas le son. Hein. Monsieur Fontana, quand vous lancez la vidéo, il faut cliquer sur le... Il y a un petit bouton pour inclure le son. Oui, oui, oui. OK. 
so you, you don't have the the sound of the video. No, there is no sound. There is no sound on the video. Okay, let me try to see if I can restart it and see whether you get the sound. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me try to start the video again. Can you hear the sound or not? No, again, there is no sound, only the, the photo, the pictures. Okay, sorry, I think, but actually uh, all the comment is uh, reading what is written. Can I just show you the video? It's like one minute. Just just read what is on the slides. Okay, I'm very okay. sorry for the, this technical okay, no problem, problem with the sound. No problem. It's, it's not a long video. Si vous voulez, je peux m'occuper de la vidéo et je vous la lance dans 30 secondes. Euh, oui, volontiers. Essayez de... Arrêtez votre partage d'écran, je m'en occupe. D'accord. Merci. Alors, tac. Je partager l'audio. Voilà, ça va marcher maintenant. Ok, super. Over 80% of conflicts take place in biodiverse hotspots. While these spots represent less than 2% of the Earth's land, they support around half the world's plants and many rare species. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the conflict wiped out 95% of the hippos, as their habitat was destroyed and the animals could not be protected from poachers. In Mozambique, the 15-year civil war crushed the elephant population from 2,000 to 200, and sometimes nature itself is used as the weapon. In Iraq, heavy crude oil was pumped directly into a river, affecting the drinking water supply. Yet in some cases, the environment benefits in war, as areas abandoned by people are left to grow wild. The laws of war protect the natural environment, not only because of its intrinsic value, but because it sustains human life. Except in rare cases when it has become a military objective, it is against the law to attack the natural environment. Uh, thank you. Merci beaucoup, Julien. Voilà, thank you very much, Julien. Vous pouvez repartager votre écran. Oui, je vais le faire tout de suite. Alors. I will share my screen, share my screen again. Perfect. Okay. And I think that should be okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. It should be okay. Now you should have. Okay, so I think I can continue the presentation. Uh, now I would like to move on to actually what the an organization like the ICRC can uh, do or how can we adapt our humanitarian response? Basically the support we bring victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence to be able to better cope with, uh, with climate change. So obviously the first step is to try to strengthen the resilience. I mean, the capacity of affected communities to, to cope, to be able to absorb these uh, shocks resulting from changing climate and, uh, and environment. But as we mentioned, I mean, the climate change is really impacting many different aspects. So it's not only really only trying to support the, the livelihood of the people. It's also trying to integrate all the other aspects regarding the health system. Is to be very systematic to try to help people respond to these emergencies. So for us, we have a lot of activities which are really targeting 
the livelihood of these people, but access to water, shelter, so habitat, and all the other elements that would allow people to be able to mitigate the consequences of climate change during the time of an armed conflict. <coughs> We also try to minimize the or integrate uh, new energies, alternative energies, and try to minimize the, the ecological footprint that we have. So if we take example like in Mali or in the Sahel countries, I mean, a lot of work that we do regarding access to water for both people and livestock, like animals, is very important to um, to protect these communities from the worst effect of climate change. You remember that in, in this part of the world, we still have many populations which are nomads, like they are herders moving with huge uh, livestock, I mean, uh, maybe 200 or 300 cattle, and really moving in between countries. If they don't have like fixed water points where they know they can go, uh, all their cattle would die, and that's basically uh, the cattle are in, in like their bank account. You know, if they don't have this uh, the wealth, this kind of wealth, the whole lifestyle would change, and these communities would be completely uh, disseminated. <clears throat> so we have this program regarding irrigation or access to water. We have program regarding uh, vaccination for both uh, people and animals, and we have also a lot of program regarding agriculture. Uh, to try to improve the the yields of the of the agriculture with tools with um, better pesticide which are also more uh, environment friendly to be able to increase the um, what people cultivate i mean the amount of uh, of food that they can cultivate and minimize the impact on the environment we have water engineers in the icrc and that's the kind of activity, like in Iraq, which is really becoming more and more important, especially in the Middle East, where access to water is particularly crucial. I think all these kind of activities are, are very important. You know that, for example, in Syria, the ICNC is ensuring like 75% of the distribution of drinking water for the whole country. So yeah. it's, a, it's a huge... Uh, support that you can provide, and if we don't provide this support, population the population would really be uh, facing a very dire situation because they would not have drinking water, and without drinking water, uh, I mean, their living condition would be extremely difficult. Uh, but beyond the activities, examples of activities as such, I think what is also very important is for uh, organization to be more conscious about the necessity to integrate all these elements about the protection of biodiversity in their activities or in their material brandy, in the way they work. So it's, it's like it has double side. It's not only trying to better protect people and mitigate the impact of, of uh, climate change, but it's also for the humanitarian organization ourselves to transform the way we work, to you know, try to be more cost efficient or energy efficient in the way we are we are functioning ourselves. So that's also a very high priority for the ICNC. In this aspect, uh, we can play a role as the International Committee of the Red Cross because we are part of the broader movement called the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. And that's basically the, the biggest humanitarian organization around the world because that's the network of you know, the International Federation of the, of the Red Cross Red Crescent, the ICNC, and all the national Red Cross Red Crescent societies around the world, all working together as one movement. So last May, uh, there was a charter adopted about a climate and environment, uh, cl climate and environment, to try to see how an organization or a movement like the Red Cross Red Crescent movement can contribute to mitigating the effect of climate change. So it's not only trying to see what other can, others can do, or how can population affected by conflict be less affected by climate change, but it's also to see how ourselves we can contribute to this change, contribute to the, the resilience of population and improve our own way of, uh, of working to mitigate our own impacts, our own ecological footprint 
uh, through our activities. So I think this commitment that uh, is taken by the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, movement is a step in the right direction. Our right to have the food is not a priority. All participants are currently requested to switch off their microphones if they're not a speaker. We also have a role of advocacy. An organization like the International Committee of the Red Cross can really speak on behalf of people affected by climate change who don't have this platform, who don't have this international uh, exposure. And this is what we do through what we call this humanitarian diplomacy at different levels, being at country levels, but also at the level of the United Nations, in big forums, you know, in Egypt, we have here platforms which are very influential. Like, for example, uh, especially about Africa, we have the Aswan Forum. Through the Aswan Forum, it's a platform where the ICRC can contribute to this debate about not only conflict, but also the effect of climate change throughout Africa. So this aspect regarding humanitarian diplomacy and the role we can play, I think it's also a, a very important role that goes beyond the, the activities, I mean, the field activities that we have. Unfortunately, I mean, we are not very optimistic about the, the years to come. We think that this, uh, the situation regarding, you know, development or underdevelopment, uh, humanitarian aid, climate change, and uh, health crisis can even worsen the situation. Uh, it's possible that they, there are more and more people who are going to need in, uh, humanitarian assistance because of this nexus between armed conflict and uh, climate change. So I think it's really important for, for all actors to contribute, to join hands, to be stronger together, to be able to to mitigate as much as possible the suffering of people because of climate change and because of the of the suffering linked to international or armed conflict, whether international or non international. I think that's the main uh, message that I wanted to convey. Uh, but I would be very happy to uh, take any question you have and if we can exchange debate, see what's your experience and how you see this. Uh, this very specific situation about the overlap between uh, situation of conflict and countries affected by uh, climate change. Thank you very much for the attention and I'm happy to take any, any question and uh, comment you have on this topic. Thank you so much, Rasha, Mr. Back to, uh, Rasha, back to you. Fontana. Yes, thank you so much for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, I, I have a question, please. Since you you said that CIC uh, right now is uh, taking the role of uh, advocacy for the people who uh, suffered from uh, uh, any uh, uh, environmental uh, problem, do you have access or uh, do you submit uh, reports to the General Embassy, uh, the uh, General Assembly uh, or the uh, Security Council? Uh, of this problem, environmental problems uh, around the world, especially in Middle East, uh, or, or no, you don't have this right? Well, it's a very good question because yes, definitely we do. We do have reports about uh, this topic. We do uh, contribute to discussions at the level of the UN Security Council on the topic of climate change. And we do have uh, very strong initiatives in different fora including now, you know, very soon, we're gonna have the COP26 in, in Glasgow, in the UK, uh, taking place very soon. So ICNC is also using these kind of opportunities to, to raise the alarm and, you know, to try to uh, make people more aware of what's to come and how we see the, unfortunately, the, the risk regarding a worsening of the situation for uh, countries affected by climate change, which are particularly vulnerable because of uh, situation of conflicts. And you know as well that next year, the, this uh, COP27 uh, on climate change is going to be in Egypt. So it will be also a very good opportunity to continue yes. all this debate yes, in, Egypt, yes. in Egypt proper. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Rasha. Uh, thank you so much. I have a question here uh, in Arabic. I will uh, from Ahmed. 
في رايك هل المنظمات غير الحكومات الدوليه ان يور اوبينيون انترناشونال ان جي اوز دو يو ثينك ذات ذي ار اكزرتنج انف افورتس ان اوردر تو ريسبوند تو ذا ديفرنت هازاردس اند ثريتس ذات ار ثريتنينج ذا هيومن سكيورتي دو يو ثينك ذات ذي ار دوينج انف ترانسليشن بليز It's already being translated. Kindly choose the translation. Kindly, kindly. Re- yeah. Sir, you didn't get it. Uh, okay. في في رأيك هل المنظمات غير الحكومية الدولية تبذل جهودا كافيا لمواجهة المخاطر التي تهدد أمن البشرية؟ In your opinion, do you think that the international uh, non-governmental organizations do they exert enough efforts in order to overcome the challenges and the risks that are facing the human security in Africa? The speaker actually, uh, uh, Mr. Fontana, is not using interpretation kindly. Let him know how to uh, use the interpretation uh, icon. Uh, if you have the options uh, at your right, so you will find interpretation uh, language. Ah, click okay. Dessus. Okay, yes. Okay, uh, I can uh, have you, you will find the channel, so try to find it in English. Right. Yes. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, translation, want me to repeat the question again? So now, sir, the question is, can you hear me first, sir? Can you hear the yes, interpretation now? Hear, okay, the hear. question, I'm reading it now. It is uh, saying that, does do the international non-governmental organizations make enough efforts in order to respond to the hazards that are facing or threatening humanity in Africa and the human security in Africa in particular? What do you think? This is one question. Another question is, what do you mean when you say environmental adaptation? Do you mean like financial ability of the country? These are the two questions, sir. Okay, th- thank you very much for the, the question. Uh, about whether, on the first question about whether uh, NGOs and other organizations are doing enough uh, regarding the hazard in Africa, uh, it's a very good question because actually, the, the international organization, uh, even the local organization, can go as far as possible, but we will never be able to substitute states. So in terms of the major push, I think the states have a major role to play to facilitate these adaptations. So we can complement, we can support, we can accompany, but I think it's, it's uh, unrealistic to expect international organizations or non-governmental organizations to completely overcome the the consequences of climate change. It has to be a teamwork. And sometimes in some countries, you have, uh, for political reason, one part of the country which is more privileged and another part of the country which is more neglected. And if there is no, uh, you know, global understanding of of uh, of the priorities benefiting everyone, it will be very difficult for only international or local NGOs uh, to, to completely, uh, uh, you know, mitigate all the consequences. The second question about environment adaptation, is it only a question of money? I don't think it's only a question of money. I think it's really a question of mindset, awareness. And uh, of course, more can be done if there's more money available. But at the end of the day, it's also a question of education, educating people, raising awareness, uh, having some contribution, empowering local communities. Also, what is very important is that different communities, different countries have different ways, traditional ways of dealing with the effect of climate change. I think the role of organizations like the ICRC is to empower these local practices to be able to cope with climate change. Uh, So more money can bring better result but it's not uh, it's not only a question of money it's also a question of of awareness and collaboration i hope it answers the the two questions uh, rashta back to you uh, thank you so much we have another uh, uh, question from uh, uh, ahmed here is his hand Ahmed, please ask your 
نعم يعني السؤال بيدور حول هل هناك انذارات مبكرة؟ My question is Are there any early warnings uh, that ICRC uh, knows about uh, what climate hazards in different places? Because we have seen uh, the Ras Garib floods uh, that has invaded the Ras Garib area in Egypt. So do you have any early warning systems? So is it before the crisis or post crisis management? So do you work on crisis early alarms or disaster management? Over. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an excellent question, because even though it's very difficult to predict with certainty uh, when like a nat uh, natural disaster will strike, like floods or drought or, or earthquake, uh, it, it's possible to be well prepared. And uh, this early warning system is actually one way of, uh, of uh, coping with the situation, but the best preparation we can have is through the, a network of volunteers to have emergency team ready to intervene whenever there are floods somewhere. And I think in Egypt, this capacity is still a little bit weak. Uh, and that's also something we're trying to see with different uh, organizations. You know, in Egypt, we have this uh, Egyptian ambulance organization who want to strengthen the capacity to answer uh, situation of, of emergencies. The Egyptian Red Crescent as well, is trying to work on uh, increasing the capacity to respond during, during emergencies. So yes, our role is to accompany these two organizations to build the capacity uh, with teams of volunteers and the means to be able to respond to emergencies as soon as they erupt. Uh, back to you, Rasha. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Iman. Iman, please. Actually, I have a question. Sir, Mr. Fontana, you have been saying that the country needs first or the state needs to have the willingness to work on the climate change and to have a response to that. So I want to know what's your evaluation or assessment of the situation in Egypt? I mean, the state procedures made and efforts made by the country in relation to adaptations and mitigations of climate change uh, thanks God, we don't have uh, uh, wars in Egypt or armed conflicts. But uh, since you work with the Egyptian state or the Egyptian government, what, what's your assessment of the performance of the Egyptian government in relation to preparedness for climate change and adaptation to it? Uh, over. Uh, Iman, thank you so much. Uh, it's difficult for me to, and it's just my role actually, to really uh, assess or judge the level of preparedness of the Egyptian authorities. So I, I would not really uh, pass a judgment on their level of, on their level of preparedness. What I can say, however, is that uh, in Egypt you also have a lot of capacity from the Ministry of Defense, and there uh, our role has also been to discuss with them and try to see how we can also contribute to increasing their capacity, because when they when there is a huge disaster, uh, they are the the structure that would be able to cope with a major, a major disaster. So that's one thing. We have the Ministry of Health also uh, that we are supporting, and that could also be a collaboration which is used uh, in times of, uh, of disaster. Uh, we have the Ministry of Social Solidarity, and we have the Ministry of Interior. So I think the the key here is the coordination between different ministries and different entities to be able to respond adequately to an emergency it takes a lot of coordination and every country around the world usually they struggle with this interministerial cooperation and with the link between state structure and non-state entities non-state organizations and as long as there is not a, a strong integration of all these different structures in in, uh, in clear mechanism to respond to emergencies, it's difficult to um, to have the best possible level of preparedness. Back to you, Rasha. There is a question, sir. That what can youth and journalists can do to you uh, to to help this? Uh, Mrs. Salah is having a question, and now he would raise his question directly. Uh, 
You, during your presentation, you have been speaking about, about us one platform, and you have said that this platform is used for dialogue and discussions in relation to climate change. Just I want to know from you, what is the main objective uh, for which you had established as one platform and who are the interactants on this uh, platform? Who are the ones who are using it? Another question. Uh, in relation to the role of the ICRC. We know ICRC is working with the victims of wars. So does the I, uh, ICRC works uh, also with the, the climate change victims when there is no conflict, I mean, I mean, uh, in the uh, Middle uh, East area? Do you have a role or? Okay, so thank you very much for the first question. Okay, about the Aswan Forum. I think the Aswan Forum is really trying to integrate many different topics. Uh, being peacekeeping operation, uh, small arms, the trade in small arms, uh, and also uh, access to different resources and the cons consequences of climate change. It's very important for us to be able to to contribute to this debate. What we what we say is that we try to shape the debate. We try to uh, make people more aware and sensitive to the reality for communities on the ground. The, specific, the specificity of the ICNC is that we have offices, we have teams in most of the countries throughout Africa and not only in the capital cities, but we also have like field offices. So we are really, you know, present in many parts of Africa where people are deeply affected by climate change and uh, usually in situations which are related to a situation of armed conflict or armed violence. So we can really bring this voice from the field. And that's what we try to convey when we speak in this platform about the reality in terms of human suffering. We're not speaking about, you know, uh, like politics in terms of a balance of power between countries and economic interest and, and other kind of consideration, which are the, the consideration of countries for us we try to really bring the voice of people who are directly affected and speak on their behalf and make them you know, contribute to this kind of dialogue. So that's the role we try to play uh, in forums like the Aswan Forum. About the second question, I mean, would ICNC also uh, have activities on climate change in places which are not affected by armed conflict? Actually, yes, we do, but differently. What I mean is that when, when we are in countries affected by armed conflict, we have a bigger team. So we have like field activities, field presence, and we're able to really implement our work directly and have a direct influence on mit mitigating the consequences of climate change. In countries like Egypt, uh, where there is no conflict, we work through relays, we, we work through different organizations. So we can also try to mitigate the impact of climate change but obviously, we don't have field offices. We don't need to have a, a bigger team in different parts of the country. So we support differently, and usually it's like through partner organizations. Uh, back to you, Rasha. Thank you so much. We have uh, two more questions, two last questions. Uh, one from Shaima Duraz. Uh, please uh, ask your questions, Shaima, please. Shaima? Well, she's just making sure if you can hear her voice. The role of ICRC is usually during the conflict or after the conflict or after the it's post disaster post crisis so what is the role of icrc before disasters happen before crises occur so i just want to connect icrc to the environmental disasters the pre preparedness or um, before it happens over well actually in many countries we are there before disaster, during a disaster, and after a disaster. So because we have a very long field presence, uh, we, we, can, we can be there even before a disaster happens. So it's not only that we would intervene only during the time of armed conflict or after an armed conflict or disaster. 
this network we have, we work in more than 90 countries around the world. So uh, in many of these countries, whenever they are like natural disaster related to climate change, we're already on the spot. What happens usually is that we, we share the responsibilities to respond with different organizations. So we try to focus on the areas where we are already most active and we, we cooperate with other organizations to work in another part of the country. So uh, in terms of presence, I think we are quite uh, having, we are, we are an organization that can really have this long presence in countries. It's also the reason why we don't leave Egypt. It means there is no conflict in Egypt, but we have been present since the First World War, so more than 100 years, and we have been present permanently since 1983. So you see, we have this very long presence that can help us uh, support the Egyptian Red Crescent, other organizations, to prepare for whatever would happen. So it's not only a work we do, actually it's even before a situation of armed conflict that we can really promote the law regarding armed, armed conflict and build this capacity to respond to emergency situation, whatever they are. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the 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 role that we play, together with you know other members of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. So maybe you have heard about the International Federation of the Red Cross. They are the one who can also contribute to supporting uh, Egyptian Red Crescent. We are also supporting the Egyptian Red Crescent. If you take countries like uh, Palestine, we have been in Palestine since '67. So we have this huge presence. Yemen is the same. We are in Yemen for the last 40 years. Uh, so it's uh, it's really a, a very long endeavor that ICRC can do to try to to help the population there. Back to you, Rasha. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jerome. Uh, last question. Uh, uh, it's on the chat. I will read it in Arabic. Uh, how can we help you as volunteers, as proactive people, as activists, as journalists? What can we do in order to help you? Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, actually, I think the role, your role as journalist is very important. And I think to be able to pick these kind of stories and to try to report about the, the, the impact of climate change, whether it's in Egypt or what we can do as well is pitch you stories about these consequences in the neighboring countries of Egypt. I think a lot of stories would interest uh, readers in Egypt about exactly this kind of situation, but maybe in Syria or maybe in, in Libya you know, like really countries which are uh, close to, uh, to Egypt or interesting to Egypt and raising awareness, contributing to this, uh, yeah, I mean, this mindset, this new mindset in, uh, in Egypt, like in everywhere in the world, in the world could be uh, very important. Now, in terms of becoming volunteers, ICNC as an organization, we don't take volunteers, but the Egyptian Red Crescent, they have a huge uh, role in recruiting volunteers. Uh, so you can contribute either as a journalist and then we can uh, try to see what would be interesting for you to um, to report about Egypt or about uh, other countries in the Middle East or Africa or you can uh, decide to uh, volunteer with the Egyptian Red Crescent. Back to you, Rasha. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, your presentation, uh, important presentation, Jerome. Thank you for being with us today, and I uh, hope to see you next uh, in uh, next uh, workshops. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the participants, and I wish you a, a very good uh, workshop on this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, participants. Thank you for the interpreters today. Uh, we this is uh, uh, the last uh, this the last um, uh, speaker uh, for today. Tomorrow uh, we have uh, uh, the session of uh, uh, the morning session, uh, nature and green economy, and uh, the afternoon 
will be uh, talking about uh, ec uh, economy, uh, trade, and uh, biodiversity in private sector. Uh, and of course, for your uh, proje projects. So uh, try to uh, work on your uh, projects for tomorrow afternoon, inshallah. Uh, see you tomorrow. And uh, thank you today. Thank you for the interpreter. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for all the participants.